58 years ago, I accepted Jesus as my personal Savior. I bowed in a Sunday school room, and the pastor led me in the prayer to see Christ as my personal Savior. And I indicate to you that that blood never loses its power to cleanse me from my sin and to make me free and whole before the Father which is in heaven. Would you take your Bible, please, and turn with me to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, verse 19. I want to tell you God is good. My name is Hal Bates. My wife is Yvonne. I pastored Collinsville First Baptist Church for 15 years. When we left there, we went to Loosedale, Mississippi, and pastored there for five years. And then after pastoring seven churches over a 40-year period, we felt like the Lord was telling us it was time to retire. Because most of the pastorate, I had very little time for my wife. And so it has been wonderful in these few years that we've been retired so far, since 19, 2016, to be able to spend time together. And the only time I wasn't with her was I broke my heel. and <laughs> So it's been wonderful to be with her all these times. So uh, I want to tell you this morning, we want to remember the Lord's Supper. Remembering is important, right? Right? Remembering is important. There was an old fellow who was playing golf, and he loved to play, and he's very good. He could hit the ball a country mile. The only problem was that he had a problem seeing. His eyes had failed him, and he couldn't see real well, but he loved the game of golf, so he continued to play golf. One day he was in the pro shop, and he was telling the pro about his problem and how that he loved the game, and he could hit real well, and, but he just couldn't find the ball after he hit it. He said, well, you know, there's this old fellow that comes in here. He don't play golf himself, but he loves the game. And from what I understand, he sees pretty well. And, you know, it would be a wonderful match if you and he could get together and uh, he could watch the ball for you. And when you hit it, then he could tell you where it goes. And so he said, well, you know, that might be a good idea. So he got together with the old fella. And so they got together and came out there one day, and uh, he teed up on the front tee, and it was a par five on the front first tee. And he hits a whopping great shot. And uh, the only thing wrong was it went toward the side of the fairway. So he gets back in the cart, and uh, he says to his new friend, he says, that was a great shot, wasn't it? The friend said, yeah. He said, I heard that click, and it sounded like it was a great shot. The guy said, well, where did it go? He said, I don't remember. <laughs> so, <laughs> remembering is important, right? <laughs> remembering is important. Man, I want you to look at your ring. Is that important? Is that important to remember what that ring represents? If you don't think that's important, you just miss an anniversary and see how important that ring is. So things are important to us. We have things that we set aside because they are remembrance, and we bring things into remembrance to us. We also know that uh, from the Scripture there are things that are important, and there are remembrances that we have. Uh, the other day we were somewhere traveling, and we saw a double rainbow. I mean, it wasn't just part of a rainbow. It was a double rainbow that went all the way over. Vaughn and I traced it down, and we dug for hours trying to find that pot of gold, but we never found it. But a rainbow is a beautiful remembrance that God said he promised he would do what? He would never cause the world to be destroyed by floods again. We also remember another situation. God said he instituted the Passover. And the Passover was to help the Jewish people remember what it was like when God delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians and the cost in which it was the deliverance came. And it was the death of the firstborn and so of all the Egyptians. And so we remember that uh, the Passover for the Jews is the time when they remember what God did for them. It was an event that God was remembering with the children of Israel what he had done for them. We also remember that whenever they crossed over the River Jordan, that on the west side of the Jordan, does anybody remember what they did? 
they took stones out of the middle of the river and they set up those stones, large stones, so that the men had to carry them on their shoulder. They set those large st stones up to set up a memorial. Now this memorial was there to help them remember the event that had taken place that God, through his supernatural power, had opened up the flooded Jordan River and the women, children, and men were able to go across the Jordan River on dry ground. And God said, when you bring your children by this monument, you will remind them of what God did supernaturally to deliver the children of Israel into the land of promise that he was preparing for them. So when Jesus comes and he says, this do in remembrance of me, he is saying when you do this, you remember the event that took place that symbolizes what I have done for you. So in Luke chapter 22, in verse 19, the Bible says, why don't we all stand as we read the word of God? Luke 22, 19. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Now, he's in the Lord's Supper now. He's, he's with his disciples there in that, in that uh, night here. Then he broke it into pieces and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You may be seated. Since there were several guys that prayed for me this morning already, we won't have a time of prayer now, when Jesus was uh, leading out and giving of the Lord's Supper, he was actually living what was going to take place in his life. Did you hear me? When Jesus was leading out in the Lord's Supper, he was actually living out what was going to happen in a few hours later. So Jesus says, he, when he took this bread and he broke it and he blessed it, he gave to his disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Now what in the world did Jesus mean when he said, this is my body which is given for you? Well, let's see what he meant. When Jesus takes that unleavened bread in his hand in that Lord's Supper, he recognizes that this bread has stripes upon it. Did you hear what I said? The bread has stripes upon it. The reason why it has stripes on it is because of the kind of ovens they used and the grapes that they used and the heat which came up from the, from the fire caused the, caused the grapes to get real hot and therefore the bread that he was using had stripes upon it so that when Jesus picked up this bread and he saw stripes upon this bread, what did it say to Jesus? It says, by my stripes, you are going to be healed. In other words, his body was going to be striped with the stripes of the cat of nine tails, and it was by that striping of his, it was by that beating of his, that we received redemption from the God the Father who loves us all in the name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now look, if I'm going to preach, you're going to say amen. I mean, that's worth saying amen to, isn't it? I mean, you don't say it unless you feel it, but if you feel it, go ahead and say it. <laughs> okay. So, here is Jesus. He takes this bread. He looks at it. It has stripes upon it. And he is remembering three times before Jesus has already told his disciples he was going to Jerusalem and he was going to die. In three days, he was going to be raised again. So as Jesus is looking at this bread, he is... Re he is verifying the fact that he is going to be beaten with a cat of nine tails. A cat of nine tails was a piece of wood about this long that had nine leather straps attached to the end of it. And at various places in that leather, there was either rock or bone or some other kind of hard substance in that, entwined in that, in that leather. And the executioner, the one who would use this cat of nine tails, it had nine strips of leather. This is really good to me, and I don't want you to go to sleep while I'm trying to tell you, okay? The cat of nine tails has nine tails on it, leather straps, and it's got bone or rock or whatever else on this leather strip. And that lictor, that executioner, whips the victim 
And when that bone hits, it embeds itself into the, into the, into the flesh. And what he did, he wouldn't do lap back like this. He would pull like this. So that whenever that bone or flesh on that leather strap would hit, he would pull it and cause the, the, the flesh to be gapped. Can I tell you that when Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me, he wanted us to remember how he suffered, how he suffered whenever they took those cat of nine tails and those people were so, so uh, informed with this uh, weapon that they could kill a person between the 39th and the 40th lash. I want to tell you the Bible says that Jesus was beaten so badly with that kind of nine tails that he was not recognizable even as a human being. It was not unusual whenever they did this kind of punishment that the entrails would show out of the, out of the body. It was not unusual for eyes to be gorged out and faces to be... Uh, parts of flesh to be gorged out. Would you hear me when Jesus was saying to his disciples, take, eat this bread, for it is my body which is given for you. And he takes that bread and had stripes upon it. He is seeing in his own mind what is going to happen to him in the very next day as he is going to suffer for the sake of mankind. But that's not all. The Bible lets us know that when Jesus took that bread, this bread, by the very nature of how it's cooked, whenever they cook this unleavened bread, it has to be pierced. It has to have holes in it so that that bread can be cooked evenly. When Jesus takes this bread, he sees that it is pierced. Folks, would you hear me? Jesus knew when he took that bread and he saw the holes in the bread, he knew that those nails were going to pierce his hand. He knew the nails were going to pierce his feet on that old rugged cross. I can't imagine the suffering that Jesus must have felt even at that time as he knew what was going to take place in his body. And he says, when you do this, when you celebrate the Lord's Supper, when you keep the Lord's Supper, when you do the Lord's Supper, you remember, you remember what I did for you. I took the stripes for you. I took the nails in my hands and in my feet for you so that you could be made right with God and have a relationship with God and then when you die, you're able to go to heaven and live with God for all eternity. Amen. Amen. God is good. He will not fail us. He has not failed us. And Jesus said as often as you eat this bread, remember why. I did this. So Jesus takes the bread. He sees the stripes. He's reminded of the cat of nine tails. He sees the piercings in the bread. And he's reminded of the nail scars in his hands and in his feet. And then the Bible says he breaks the bread. He breaks the bread. He said, remember that my body is given and broken for you. Would you remember with me that when Jesus was at the home of Mary, Martha, and Bethany, you'll remember that Martha, uh, Mary came in and she took her bottle of ointment of, of perfume, costly perfume. And, and with the way these bottles are fixed, these vases are fixed, you can't open the vase without breaking it. And when you break it, when you break that vase, what happens is, is the perfume escapes and fills the whole room. So what this lady did, she broke the vase, she took the perfume, and she anointed the body of Jesus. She didn't know that she was anointing the body of Jesus for burial. She was just doing what she wanted to do for Jesus, whom she loved so very much, and she put this perfume upon him. Now listen to me. When she opened that body and put that perfume on Jesus, the smell of the perfume just filled the place. The aroma of that perfume just filled the place. The bottle was broken, and therefore the aroma filled the place. The Bible says that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, that the veil in the temple was ripped from Help me. Top to bottom. 
the veil was torn in half. In other words, what was inside the veil, which was the presence of God, was now when the broken body of Jesus, as Jesus' body was broken and torn, it allowed the very presence of Almighty God to come and live and dwell in the presence of every person who believes and repents of their sin and follows after Jesus. Can I say to you that when we take the Lord's Supper this morning, we would remember his body, his body and the fact that it was broken for you and for me. The fact that the nail scars in his hands and his feet, the fact that his body was striped with a cat of nine tails, and the reason why he did it was because he loved you, he loved me, and he loved every person in the whole world. So he said, when you do this, remember what it means. Then the Bible says, then the Bible says that he took the cup at the end of the Lord's Supper. Luke verse 22, chapter 22, verse 20. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you and for me. Life is in the blood. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11, the Bible says, So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven which was not made by human hands and is not part of his created world. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he emerged, the, he entered the whole, most holy place once and for all and secured our redemption forever and forever. Would you remember with me when Jesus was walking along the hills over the Jordan River? When John looks up and John the Baptist looks up from his baptizing and he sees Jesus afar off. What does, Jesus, what does John say about Jesus? Say it. Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The Bible says there is no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. God spoke to the Israelites way back yonder and said that you must sacrifice these lambs in order to lead to the perfect sacrifice which will come as Jesus. He would be the perfect sacrifice and the perfect lamb which does not have to keep sacrificing but one sacrifice will be enough for him. And this lamb had to be perfect and without blemish. Was Jesus perfect and without blemish? Well, when they take the lamb to be sacrificed, they inspect that lamb from top to bottom. And then they open that lamb up and they inspect all of its entrails so that it is perfect for the sacrifice to God. Was Jesus inspected? Hello? Was Jesus inspected? You remember when he was brought before Pilate and he stood there and they tried to get witnesses to come and to bear witness of what Jesus had done wrong. And the Bible tells us that though they tried to get witnesses, none of them would agree. Was he the perfect lamb? Was he proven to be the perfect lamb whose blood was going to be spilled out so that all who would look to the blood would be forgiven of their sin and be made right with God. Oh, folks, I can't tell you how wonderful it is to lay my head on my pillow at night knowing that all of my sin is under the blood and not one sin does God hold to my account because it's all been covered under the precious, powerful, cleansing blood of Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, who gave his life Life is in the blood. Jesus Christ gave his life. His blood was poured out for us. 
whether it was in the beatings, whether it was the piercing of the, of the, of the crown of thorns, whether it was the piercing of the nails in his hands and feet, or whether it was the piercing of the, the spear that pierced his side when blood and water ran out, that precious blood was shed by the perfect Son of God that you and I might have eternal life with him. God is good. Memories are good. This morning we have friends that are out of town and they said, would you come feed our cat for us? <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm not a real cat lover, but I'll come feed your cat. <laughs> so this morning, I went out and, uh, what time is it? So I went out to feed the cat. Got in my car and went down the road. It's a long way, fairly long way to feed the cat. So as I'm going, there is this song that comes on the radio. Uh, have you ever heard that song which says, I wish you were here? Heaven is so beautiful. I wish you were here. I wish you could enjoy what I'm seeing today because heaven is so wonderful. It's about, it's, it's actually a testimony of somebody who's died and gone to heaven and they're talking about how beautiful it is and how wonderful it is and how that they wish all their relatives and kin folks were there. So I was listening to that this morning and I went and fed the cat and I started out uh, there was a song that came on and it says the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. Gary, I bet you know what that song says, don't you? For the God of the mountain is still God in the valley. When things go wrong, he'll make it right. Well, I was listening to that song on Wildcat Road and I came to the intersection of Wildcat Road and 19. There was a sweetest little lady. Her name was Margie Watson. Wonderful lady. Beautiful alto voice. Loved to hear her sing in church. And her song that she sung was The God of the Mountain is Still God in the Valley. And I had to sit there at that intersection because at that intersection she pulled out in front of a transport truck and it killed her instantly. And hearing that song that said, I wish you were here. I wish you could see the beauty and the glory of heaven and all that God is. I wish you were here. And then to remember what had happened to her and how the God of the mountain was her God of the valley as well. Can I tell you, as we come to the Lord's Supper this morning, we need to remember the bread that it was striped, that it was pierced, and that it was broken. So that this is exactly what Jesus has done for us. And then we remember the, the blood of the perfect sacrifice who is Jesus, who poured out his life so that we might be made right with God. The Bible says that when we have the Lord's Supper, we're to inspect ourselves. We are to inspect ourselves to see if there's anything wrong with our life, if there's anything between us and God. And if there is, we need to confess that to God and get it out of the way. For some of us, it may even take reconciliation. For some of us, it might even take restitution. For some of us, it may be going to a person and saying, look, I'm sorry I offended you. Or going to a person and say, you offended me. But Jesus says, the Apostle Paul says that when we come to the table, we need to come with inspection. Am I saved? Am I born again? Are my sins washed away? Do I have a new spirit dwelling in me that was created by Christ when I professed him as my Savior? Do I have the Holy Spirit living in me? And is it evidenced by the way I live, by what I say and what I do and where I go and who I'm with? God is good.
Amen? God, would you say it with me? God is good. And I am so glad that at 10 years old, he called my name. And he has redeemed me unto God by his blood. And I belong to him. And he is my father. He is my Abba father. And I am his son. And I love him dearly. And I know many of you feel just that same way. But if you don't today, if you're not sure whether or not you're born again, whether or not you have the Holy Spirit living in you, whether or not your sins are forgiven, why don't you make that sure today before we have this Lord's Supper? Or if you've never trusted Christ as your personal Savior, maybe today is the day that you need to come to Him seeing what He did for you so that when you die, you won't go to hell. Or so that when you walk out of these doors, you won't walk out as a victim of all that Satan can do, but of a Savior who loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Would you pray with me? Lord, we are so thankful for the Word of God. And we are glad that your word never fails. And possibly, Heavenly Father, under the sound of my voice this morning, there is someone who's never trusted you as personal Savior, who's never prayed to receive your forgiveness as they repent, who's never prayed for you to allow them to be born again, has never prayed for the Spirit of God to take over their life. If that be the case, Lord, then may today be the day of their salvation. Lord, there may be someone here today who's gotten saved since they were baptized. And Lord, you said the very first witness of our salvation is baptism. And that we ought to be baptism, baptized because of our faith in you. It could be that someone's prayed the prayer here, but they've never followed through with believer's baptism, showing that they have died to self to be alive to God. And today, Lord, if that be so, then I pray that today that would be handled and that, Lord, it would be made right. Father, there may be those here this morning who, who are in their sin. They have known sin in their life, and they've not confessed their sin to you. So, Lord, if that be the case, then I pray that even as we look at the bread and the blood, we see the great price you paid and at what you expect from us. We love you, Lord. Thank you in Jesus' name for loving us. Amen. If there's a decision that you need to make today, God loves you and he wants you to make that decision for him. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. Jesus paid it all. Amen? Amen. He paid it in full. There is no more debt to be paid he paid it all. And if you've never received salvation or if you never followed him in believer's baptism or if you're living in unconfessed sin, then I invite you to be made right with God this day. Brother Gary, would you lead us in Jesus paid it all? 134, would you stand with me as we sing?